Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the 10 Laws Podcast with East Forest. I'm East Forest, and today I have an episode with Sarah Neufeld. You might know Sarah from uh, her work in the band Arcade Fire. She has been a longtime member of that group, and she is a solo artist. She's a she's from Canada, but she's a primarily a violinist, and she lives in New York City now. And I got to see her perform twice. Is it twice? Yeah, once was a long time ago, and we referenced this in the in the conversation at one of the wanderlusts out at Tremblant when I was performing the very first summer that I went out um, outside Montreal. And then I saw her again a little more recently in Portland at Mississippi Studios when she was performing with Colin Stetson. They did a collaborative album that's really uh, interesting and dreamy and deep. And that was a great live concert too. So it was it was just great to be able to reach out and get a chance to just connect and dive deeper into her world. We recorded this like end of May, early June, something in there. So just letting you know, it was a while ago and times were definitely crazy then. They're crazy now, but it's always good to give context about you know what comes up. But I really was pushing her to get so we could get into kind of her world and her process. And I think for herself and for me, we're all we even recognize. Yeah, this is a, it's strange to be having these conversations when there's so much other stuff going on, um, which is true. But nonetheless, I really enjoyed getting to know her and getting to share with you a bit more about her work. Um, She's also a founding member of a contemporary instrumental ensemble called Bell Orchestra, which uh, she references as well. So lots of opportunities to check out her work. Um, On August 14th, this Friday, I'll be releasing a track with an artist named Anna sometimes known as DJ Anna. She is a Brazilian artist who does a lot of work in the techno world. And we met recently and started exploring a collaboration together, just kind of making music together. And what came out is a single that we titled Voyager. And it's an ambient piece where I play some piano and she creates this analog synthesizer background. And it's really moody and dreamy. And you should be able to check out that piece Uh, Wherever you listen to music, it'll be on all the streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple, and so forth, this Friday, August 14th. So check out that new release from East Forest, myself, and Anna. On August 16th, it's looking like I'm going to be doing an Instagram Live on Ramdas's page. So it's sort of like they've been hosting different musicians to do performances, and I'm either going to perform live on the Ram Dass Instagram page on August 16th, or I'm, I'm also thinking about maybe sharing like B sides and rarities, like unreleased tracks, stuff that didn't make it on the Ram Dass album that maybe that would be interesting for you to hear. I don't know. Let me know if you have a preference. You can t- let me know on social media, just tag East Forest on Instagram or East Forest Music, Facebook and Twitter. And you can always just send an email to team at eastforest.org. And we'll also have somebody else, I think, come on and we we engage in conversation. So it should be a fun event. And because it's an IG Live, there's the opportunity for you guys to hop on and like ask questions and comment and get get into the conversation. I'm not sure what time that's going to be at, but we'll let you know. Stay tuned. Thanks for giving a podcast a review. Do it right now. You can do it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, The reviews help me get uh, good guests and it's easy to do. Also, just sharing the podcast. Thanks for doing that. Uh, it's been super hot here. Uh, Rod and I got out to the Tetons for a couple days to visit my friend Scott. He lives totally off grid out there and has for 25 years. And his place he made entirely out of salvaged materials. It's inc- I think he told me he spent like 35 bucks on the place. <laughs> and he has a, a complete beautiful cabin. Uh, there's an outhouse. There's a sauna. He's got a workshop. So it's pretty set up. It's just, it's it's remarkable to think how much you can put together from essentially things you find in the dump or on construction sites that they're not using and just gathering and salvaging and being resourceful and upcycling. So that was awesome. And he took us up into the high country because I completely live for time in the Alpine. You know, you can only be up there for a couple months of the year. 
and wherever you are, and inevitably snow comes pounding back. So when you get up there, it's such rarefied space and air, and both literally and energetically. And just being up there with the the Grand the Tetons and all the other mountains, and you can see the glacial valleys and all the wildlife. We saw uh, two bald eagles up there. I saw lots of different other birds. I saw a fox. We saw little marmots. We saw two moose. I've never seen a moose before. I put a video of one of the the big bulls that we came across when we were canoeing on my Instagram. It was unreal how large that animal is. And let me tell you, the way you want to see a moose is like that. You're in a canoe. There's a water barrier, but you're actually quite close to the animal. The moose is relaxed. (laughs) It wasn't like sleeping at a zoo. You know, he stood up, he walked around, he was looking at us. We had this engaged, uh, you know, like a minute or two passing by. Absolutely incredible. Just regal, stunning, amazing, amazing animal. So that was that was a nice trip. And then I'm going to be heading out to Portland for a friend's wedding in Hood River. But I'm going to be stopping in the studio out there to do some recording with some friends uh, for this record I'm finishing up. I'm getting into recording strings, which is a big, big moment. And I've been working with Lorna Dune, Lorna Creer. Her artist name is Lorna Dune. And she's helping me do the arrangements f- uh, for some of these songs. And her work has just been stunning. So I cannot wait to share with you some of these new tracks because they are totally, just totally awesome. They're making me feel really good. But let's dive into this conversation with the incredible Sarah Neufeld. We met uh, very briefly, and I'm not. this is not me putting you on the spot like you should remember. You wouldn't, but you played a gig. We were both playing at Wanderlust many years ago. Oh, and yeah. you were playing in a little church. I think it was outside Montreal, maybe. Um, yeah. Tremblant. Yeah, that was at Tremblant. Yeah. It's funny yeah, because yeah. I searched for your email in my, you know, because I realized I had gotten the time wrong. And then an email from 2014 popped up. Cause, oh, no. Because we were I don't on remember the same, emailing you. You didn't. But we were on oh. the same email thread. And I was like, wait, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, it's wanderlust. That was like the first year actually that I went out and was kind of playing out as East Forest, and that was some of the first gigs I got. And I remember you were playing there. Anyway, I bought cool. your CD. Aww. We were like chit chatting a little bit. So <laughs> <laughs> we met. A little, yeah, um, which I've enjoyed, and that's kind of when I got introduced to your work and your mm-hmm. music. And then I saw you play in Portland. I used to live in Portland. Okay, you and Colin did that tour at Mississippi yeah. Studios. You guys did a great show. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So anyway, nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. So are you, tell me a little bit about the intersection, if there is one, between meditation, wellness, the inner space, and your music. Because I know I have one, and I know, I'm pretty sure you're a yogi. And the fact that you're playing somehow through Wanderlust at the beginning leads me to believe there's something there. And I'd like to hear it from you. Yeah. Well, like the ba- the the bio part of that answer before I get into a little the real some, part. Yeah. It'll buy me some time. <laughs> but um, I <clears throat> I came to yoga early, like early on in my life. Uh, about 1998, I had moved to mm-hmm. Montreal from the West Coast, and I had not, I hadn't been interested in yoga growing up. I grew up like in a pretty hippie, rural British Columbia Island environment. So there was like, there were monks meditating in in teepees and stuff like a stone serve from my house. And really, so that was my upbringing, not my, not in my immediate family, but in my immediate community. And it was a really, really nice community and really like, not as much like yoga practice yogis, but total yogi neighbors. And so that was just sort of like, I just sort of thought that that was the world because I was very sheltered. And then I moved to Montreal and I missed, like, I missed a lot of of physical practices that I had as a, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Like I'd been in dance my whole life and I, I missed, I didn't know what it was that I was missing, but I missed a, a mind body connection and a like an ecstatic connection also to my physical being. And I was just like in music school, you know, drinking beer and like staying up really late and 
jamming and like that was amazing and it led me to all of the things literally all of the things I'm doing now are a result of those first few years of music school in in Montreal it was such a formative time there were so many amazing musicians connecting and making projects and we literally are still like my work with Bell Orchest and Arcade Fire is directly from like those years but I was feeling like not in my body and not great physically. And I started going to Ashtanga and, um, that was wild and super intense and kind of like too much of a hardcore world for me at the time. Cause I was not adopting like a strict Ashtangi lifestyle at that moment and right. probably never will. <laughs> um, I- And then I eventually, you know, I played around with a lot of different styles of yoga and I found uh, a community in like 2004 and it was called Moksha back then and originated in Canada as like a, like an alternative heated practice with a lot of different background and background and also like, also some devotional yoga, like the, the founders were we're hanging out with a lot of like bhakti yogis and, but there was also like really therapeutic and super accessible and environmentalist. And um, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with that whole thing and ended up doing the teacher training. Um, And so through that path, and I was also on tour that whole time, like that was when my career as an artist sort of was coming up because 2004 was the first year that like, Arcade Fire was really getting out there. We like put out our first album and Bell Orchestra was also touring. And so I was like back to back to back to back to back, like years of this. It's totally, probably it was pretty nonstop. I it mean, was those totally, years, yeah. Yeah. And I was young too. So it was, it was all like, it was perfect for the time. But, but again, I found myself really need, needing to lean into actually adopting more of like a, a more serious practice and more, I was starting to do breath work at the time, just like, you know, we get out of balance and all sorts of things come up. And so I I kind of adopted like a more serious daily kind of practice in those years, like mid 2000s and did the teacher training at the, like 2009, I did my teacher training with Moksha in India. And part of that training is a, like a large meditation component. And the teacher that has always done that, um, primarily is this amazing Zen Buddhist teacher named Frank Jude Boccio. He wrote a book called Mindfulness Yoga, which is really awesome. And he's this like super cool, real rock and roll dude out Mm -hmm. of, out of Arizona. And he used to be, actually, he's a New Yorker, but he's been in Tucson forever. And he used to like, used to like DJ punk records in New York in the 70s. Like he's just so badass. So anyway, I met him and we were like, music, music, music. And then he was the meditation guy and the Buddhist theory guy. And I just sort of like really fell in love with that approach and that kind of weaving into the yoga practice because I hadn't really been meditating at that time yet. And so I, you know, I just sort of pulled from from a few different traditions at that point and kind of cobbled together my own practice over the few, next few years. And a lot of that was simple, like mindfulness, um, Zen kind of meditation, and and a lot of pranayama, like basic pranayama, um, that I learned from another teacher, and that all that helped me, I think incredibly find my way as a as a composer at that point I'd only not only but I'd been really busy being a collaborative artist like I I had played in bands that, that's often the case with string players right mm-hmm. it's like yeah yeah but I'd always been so I'd always been an improviser like since li- literally since I was two the only way my mom could get me to like practice I mean okay when you're two, yeah, yeah, whatever. When I was okay, two, three, I yeah. Well, three-year-olds can practice. I was, I was practice. a baby <laughs> grabbing my brother's violin at two. I didn't have to practice back then. I wasn't even technically supposed to touch the thing. But the way that my mother got me to be a bit more like adherent to the daily thing was through improvisation. And she's she is a classically trained flautist, but has a great ear and would play 
improv games with me. And so I always, you know, and I studied jazz um, improv and I studied composition. And so those worlds were like very alive in my, in my brain. I'd never been a repertoire player. I'd always written my own <clears throat> stuff, but like in my head or improvised or played jazz. And so then, you know, that was really what the work that Bell Orchestra was doing was about. It was like really free form improvised based composition. Um, but in a large group setting, like five, six people, Arcade Fire, much more structured, much more like, you know, find some some ways of voicing string parts that are like woven into the main right. melodies and counter melodies of the Arcade yeah. Fire songs. Like that's totally a different world. But I felt like I was kind of like a part of me was maybe wanting to wanting to grow or bust out of this like collaboration only mindset. And so I think actually like the, the yoga training and the meditation and the breathing kind of helped me find the kind of focus I needed to start writing like more serious um, composed music of my own. And then it just sort of went from there. And I find like your, so your original question, like I find that, that kind of practice like allows you to open up your own mind or potential. And I wouldn't, I, when I'm not, when I'm not in my practice, I find it also really hard to write music and to, mm -hmm. and to like be in my, be as deep in my music practice as I want to be. I, I hear in some of your solo work that you've been releasing, there's a kind of, tension and there's uh, an introspective quality to it that I've, that's where it pushes me a bit. It feels like an inner space, but one that uh, feels a bit liminal in a way. And I'm curious if like your own, like if the process of making that music is like that for you, do you feel like it's an exploration of your inner space or is it like, no, I don't have that kind of agenda with it. I'm just trying to like, the music's kind of, it is what it is. Well, right. it's both. It is what it is, but it's also totally an exploration of my inner space. But like, that's what I think all music is. But, <laughs> but yeah. because I'm writing wordless music mostly, and my influences are a lot of minimalism and electronic music. It, I think that is exaggerated. That feeling is exaggerated because all of that kind of music it, kind of lends itself to the feelings of introspection and delving into the, <laughs> into the subtle realms. But yeah, I, I find like, that's what I find really fascinating about, about writing that kind of music. Like I, I get into this, like, it feels like minutia, but it's the kind of minutia that you can't focus on because if you focus too hard, you lose a thread. It's like this really weird balance between like, trying to make it happen and letting it happen. Yeah. It's like, if you think about it too much, um, it doesn't really happen. Yeah. It's like for me, improvisation or the process of repetition, just kind of like you just keep working at different ideas and things start to bubble out. And that's where I could see, like you're saying, the practice of mindfulness or the things that help you essentially get out of your head mm -hmm. then to creating more music or better music. Which is funny because like also then it gets, you get really in your head when you're writing music, as you know, like, you know, that's what's great about music. It's like this, yeah. you know, right, left brain thing. It's like yeah. it's numbers, but it's creativity. And yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And w so what's it been like for you the past few months when we're not allowed to really tour and we've got this whole different way of being performers and musicians and you're in New York, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. a whole nother level of intensity. I, mean, I used to live in New and York. Right but now, it, I mean, everything's just feels like a weird day to be like talking about music and enjoying <laughs> like, like it's just, you know, it's I'm a getting, weird time. It's, it's such a weird time. Like I'm getting these photos sent to me from friends in the city, like, look, like Soho's destroyed. And, you know, reading about like the whole world is on fire. And so when people are listening to this, it's June 1st and yeah. um, depending on when this will come out in the future. Mm. And so uh, there's a lot of social unrest going on right now. And racial tension but 
I, I do feel that it's connected to this overall tension. We've kind of been in this pressure cooker for generations, really, racially, but also with the COVID and yeah. people being out of work and and class issues going on, who's getting hit the hardest, and it's sort of starting to bubble over and anger at uh, Trump and the leadership of sort of, it's sort of been poking the finger at the bull for a long time. So absolutely, I feel like overall, we've, we're continuing to be now in this larger shift that we've been in. Some would call it collapse, but either way, it's major change. Yeah. It's major change. It's, and look, what we were just saying, it's also parts of those tentacles of change were existing in our lives as musicians. Like they've been dramatically changed in the last few months. I mean, this is yet yeah. another example of the thousands of different ways our lives have all changed and some Absolutely, yeah. really badly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, so I also, run, I run two yoga studios in New York. Two, oh, you do? So the, the community called Moksha Yoga changed its name. We, we changed our name to Modo um, in the States and then the whole brand. So when I refer to my studios, it's Moto, but it's, it's the, it's that same community that I was talking about earlier. So in, in 2010, we started looking for spaces and started coming to the city a lot. Um, myself and another, one of my long, a long time friends, Rebecca Foon, who's also a cello, a cellist and composer. She has a project called Saltland and Esmerine that you might've listened to. It's kind of probably your jam and She's amazing. And uh, anyway, we wanted to do this thing. We wanted to build the com- a community like the one that we were a part of in Montreal in New York City. <clears throat> and so we opened our first studio in 2011, and then we opened another location in, in Williamsburg in 2016. Um, all the while, like both of us touring a lot, and you know, we have other team members and employees on the ground. But... Um, mm-hmm you know, we're, I, I live here now, so I'm fairly involved. And so in March, when the shit was getting real, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of went like, okay, we, we pulled out, we closed our, our businesses a few days before the mandate came through and everything has just been, you know, and I was supposed to be on tour with Bellar Cast right after that. And like, we were supposed to be touring and releasing an album this summer. And you know, the story. Everybody, yeah. every musician has the same story because this is all like, the plans changed. <laughs> all the plans changed, and and our business is closed, and so we've just been like, you know, trying to rethink our our wheel and do the thing that everybody's doing, which is going online. And a lot of wellness companies have been online for years and are basically like have tech company components within their structures, and you know, we don't have any of that. We're really we're quite grassroots. We're just like a group of people (laughs) and we have these studios. So we've been, that's been really challenging because, you know, you always feel like you're behind. It's kind of like when you're a musician and you're not a recording engineer, but you're trying to produce and you feel like you're Mm -hmm. 20 steps behind. And like, it's, it's, that has been part of my experience for the past few months. Just like, oh my God, I have to, I'm 20 years behind. I have to catch up like on everything because otherwise I don't exist. (laughs) Yeah, it's like I, I was thinking, I was saying this to my friend the other day, uh, Justin, he's in the glitch mob, and I was asking what they're doing and stuff. And we're, I was like, bro, I never signed up to be a videographer. Like, I feel like right now I'm by myself trying to figure out like webcams and encoders and switchers. And like, it's like, I don't have much of an interest in this. And I don't want this to be like what I have to do. I know. But I felt that that kind of tug inside me too of like, you well, you you need to not you be left to. behind, but yeah. that's, I feel like that is the gift in the experience for me yeah. is this feeling of like, what is that feeling I have of being left behind by the wave? And if anything, I feel like yeah. there's a descent of something letting go of something dying yeah. and it's me trying to prop it up because a lot of us feel we have to, and some of us do have to, it's like yeah. a practical, like, how do yeah. we make money? Yeah. But we're in this in between state of like, but what is the thing that's trying to emerge? And does it have to do with pause? Does it have to do with less? Does it have to do with more value to the things I do? I don't feel like I have to be at the speed perhaps yeah. I was at for the last few years. I, I, I honestly don't know, yeah. but I have that feeling inside well, that, me. That resonates with me a lot. A lot of it is about pause and and simplifying, downsizing, just like downsizing the amount of like freaking 
matcha lattes. I mean, this is like, the, <laughs> I sound like the worst person ever, but like my consumption habits changed so drastically that now when yeah. I do like venture out into the world and go like, you know what? I am going to get that matcha latte. Like, it's so wasteful to do that. Like I really, you know, it, it really, it really makes you notice what, what you took for granted before in terms of, you know, how we interact with the world and how we are as like consumers in a capitalist society. One, the privilege, yeah. Life with so much, um, you know, discrepancy between those who have excess income and those who are struggling to get by. And as we're all now like more, so many millions of people are struggling to get by more than they were before. It does allow you to rethink your whole way of being and going like, but how does a city like this, like New York city, how do, how does this place thrives on that? Like New York city used to be a place where artists would come and just like live in dirty warehouses and make crazy shit and be in community. But it's not like that anymore. It's, it's money here. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's been really wild, like rethinking, how do you live in a, in a place that is kind of the epitome of, of like, you know, you got to stay on top. You've got, you, you can't be left behind. Those who get left behind don't like, make it here. I mean, there's the whole making it here thing, right? Like where I'm from, that mentality doesn't even exist. The like, island you grew up on oh, man. and, the yeah. months, and your, your yogi neighbors, <laughs> My yogi it wasn't neighbors. A, they weren't going like, to spit you out. Yeah. You're like, oh, silly city people caught up in your silly concerns. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like my, my whole family's on Vancouver Island and I'm not, I'm not saying nothing's changed, but it's not a drastically different way of life. Like my mom grows most of her food. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. N- New York City changed in the mid '90s. I my f- I first started going there in '95 when I was in college, and I remember I was down on uh, like Astor Place, and that Kmart. I think it's still there. It <laughs> opened, and that was the first big box kind of store. Right. And I remember right, and then everything else started to follow. Like Starbucks was across the street, and everything, and all the mom and pops. It, it really started to shift, mm-hmm. and then it, over the years, it became like this international city of intense money, and mm-hmm. a lot of the areas like Soho, it's sort of like a mall, you know, outdoor mall. Williamsburg is a mall now. Really? Oh yeah. When's the last time you were here? I I lived in Dumbo until 2010, so I was there for about nine years. And Dumbo, <laughs> talk about change. I mean, that used yeah. to be the last place where you could, uh, in inner Brooklyn, of warehouses and artists and stuff. But mm-hmm. so I, I, I guess I've been, last time I was there was a couple years ago uh, yeah. to play a show. But um, so you've you've seen how crazy oh, yeah. Brooklyn is. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't been through Brooklyn as much, mm-hmm. um, but I've I've heard that like places that I used to think were the ghetto are now like cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, I remember dropping my friends off in like Bed Stuy and stuff, and I've heard that's kind of a good place to be now. I'm moving to Bed Stuy. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. <laughs> and I'm moving like further into Bed Stuy than than most people I know that live in Bed Stuy, and that's yeah. like, yeah, that's and talk about the wave of gentrification, right? Like, yeah, it's deep. Yeah, it's just <laughs> so. <bad. laughs> Anyways, yeah. But I know I know it's hard with the yoga in particular because my partner owns a yoga studio here in Boise, Idaho, and they actually just opened today. Oh, yeah. But the capacity, you know, they can only fit 12 people instead of 30 or 40. Mm-hmm. And how is that even a business model? You it's know what not, I mean? Like, and, You're lucky at that point if you can just, like, break even. With, I don't even know if they will. Yeah. Well, on, Rent? like, have to keep your online thing up and you have – but it's, it's mental like that. So that actually, like to get back to your, your previous question, like that's been a a large part of my day to day, but I also thankfully have been playing music a lot too. Like I I have a friend who's a percussionist and she needed a a place to land. And we had this empty building in bed that we were supposed to like be renovating and moving into. Mm -hmm. But, um, all of that was on pause. And so she's kind of been like camped out there and, and in another room, 
I just decided to set up my, my music stuff. Cause I needed, I didn't have a, a, a real spot, um, to do that. And, and so we decided to just kind of pod a little bit together and just play Great. music as much as possible. And so we've been doing like some online performances and that, and, and trying to get, um, out from being complete, like technophobe, technophobic music weirdos like okay we've really got to figure out how to mix our live sound down into this iphone (laughs) (laughs) you know so i've got that cable and um (laughs) but it's been it's been cool because writing music in this time feels like it's not like that i think i'm doing anything important but i think it's important to write music during this kind of time and it's important to, to, to write. If you're a writer, like I I heard this incredible interview. Um, oh my God, I'm just going to blank and not even like tell you which writers were talking to which other writers, but they're saying like in, in, in like big moments in history and times of like really tough times or really interesting times. It's, it's the, I mean, it's the poetry and the writing that comes out of those times. And I'm going to add to that the music. Um, that comes out of those times that is like a p- part of the, the way we can like look at history and, and look at, look at it all, look at all the humanity involved. So I think like, and I think, I know a lot of people like we know are actually having more time to create. So I think that's a really beautiful part of this whole thing. I I've had like maybe less time cause I'm so busy trying to be yeah, in online studio, in studio. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah. Like that, all I want to do is is write music all day long these days. I think there'll be some great art that comes out of this, no doubt. Um, I've found for myself, I don't know if this is true for you, that, I don't know, I was getting used to a certain energy of offering something in public and then you're, you're getting, it's like an energy exchange that yeah. was fulfilling and I was probably leaning on it more than I'm proud to realize I was. Like performing? It, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just, that ex- that exchange of energy, like it's kind of a affirmation of like, okay, I'm playing something and I'm getting that energy back. And when you don't have that, and I'm I'm just now basically by myself and yeah. recording, which is great and nourishing, but I'm also like, I feel a little out of balance in in nourishment totally. of like I get a little just like in my head about the creating and is this good or not? I don't know. And the motivation too. Yeah, it's like some days I'm motivated, but some days I'm not at all. I'm like I don't want to do anything. Yeah. Even though like it's easier sometimes when you have like a recording day with someone or I don't know, a gig, like, I have to rehearse. You yeah. know, I got to get yeah. some shit together. Yeah. 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 That feeling you're talking about. I often wonder like, is that just like ego validation of a particular <laughs> brand that like performing artists are really like addicted to, but it, even if it is just, I don't think it's purely ego because as you said, there really is an exchange that happens and it's real and it's why people like to come to live shows and it's, it's why live music is so great. And it, and so like, yeah, we're on the stage doing that thing. And so we're a huge part of that exchange. And even if it does on one hand sort of smack like ego validation, like I need other people to think I'm awesome to feel like I'm, I should keep doing it. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Well, if that's the logs you put on the fire, it's still serving a purpose. I mean, we all have to be nourished. And it is weird. Like I used to, I mean, people always talk about like the depression that you get after tour, Mm. which I didn't really get before, but that's because I always had another tour coming up. And now (laughs) I'm like, oh, (laughs) yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, none of us know when we're getting back. If, if, and I don't even know that's the other the other half is like I don't know what I want to get back to. It's not that I'm saying I'm quitting or anything like that. I'm yeah. just but I don't want to just I don't want to just repeat something of the past. I want it to be new. I want it to be different. I want it to be more conscious. Hmm. I just don't know how that's going to look yet. Yeah. But the, the, I think the, if we have any grace, it's that we're being given time. Yeah. For better that, or worse. Yeah. Um, and amidst it all, we don't even know what kind of world we're creating in and for, as we were just speaking to. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I think at the end of the day, we are responding to our world, our lives, and the world around us. And that world is changing. So it's hard to say what our response will be as artists because 
all these structures that we thought maybe we, people were relying on aren't as stable anymore. The things that were the most stable. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at how much the music industry has changed in the last 10, 15 years, I mean, this, like live was kind of all that we, <laughs> that we, and we really leaned on it. Like, yeah, like that's where we make our money. That's, that's like what we kind of like organize our lives around. And we don't know when that's coming back. And it's just, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Like music will exist forever, but what now? Like, what is that going to look like? And we, no one has any clue. Maybe, maybe some people have a clue. Well, they think they do, but no one does. I don't. They, <laughs> yeah, it's hard. To, no one knows what will happen. Um, mm. wh- well, I'd love to ask you a bit more about sort of your process of creation, even if it does feel sort of strange in these days, because it's an opportunity. I mean, these conversations that I have on the podcast essentially are evergreen in that they could be listened to at any point in time. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, selfishly for myself, I like to get into the head and the process creatively of people that admire your work. And I'm just curious what it is like for you when you create, what that process looks like. You said, is it improvisationally based largely or, or is there a different method? Um, it's kind of, I guess, I guess like a lot of the ideas come out sort of improv based, but that's kind of like where I get my source material from. I'll just kind Mm -hmm. of play and then as soon as I land on a thing that calls my attention in a particular way, I'll then start to like, (laughs) I'm going to use the word attack. I'll attack it. No, but I'll like, I'll work it. I'll like try to push and pull on it from every angle until I find like what I, what the direction that that at that moment in time that I want to, to see if it'll go in. Like, oh, maybe it can be this type of piece. Maybe it's a really fast piece. Maybe it's the type of piece that builds on on itself, like phrase upon phrase, like, or maybe, (laughs) maybe it's a drone piece, you know, like I'll sort of like work on a figure or a set of figures, like melodic, melodic gestures or rhythmic gestures until they make enough sense and have enough flavor that... I'll go, oh, it, okay, it's going to land somewhere like in this kind of a thing. And then it's really, it's just painstaking because a lot of it is a lot of notes really fast. Yeah. And I can't like, it's, it's virtuosic to play in the way, like a lot of it is virtuosic to play in the way that it needs to be played. But I'm also writing as I'm like, I'm playing as I'm writing. And so it's like, it's, fr- it's, that's a frustrating element. It's like physically awkward and, you know, you can hear where you want it to go, but you can't, your body can't get there as fast as your mind can. And like, that's, that's how I write, but it also trains me to play in these different ways. And the hours of, you know, of working out these ideas are a sort of like, um, technique practice as well a lot of repetition right because you you play something I play something like a thousand times as I'm adjusting it and as I'm furthering the idea so it's I mean it it, it's yeah and then sometimes things just kind of come out more fully formed but the thing that I'm describing is like the majority of my stuff it's kind of it's painstaking and and a little bit like working out or something like it's well would you say the majority of the music that you're personally making is faster like that and sort of a lot of notes yeah versus elongated or slower is there a re- is there a conscious decision there is that just what it always ends up coming out as i well i have i it's yeah it's more i would say like 75 percent of my pieces are fast with a lot of notes and the slower pieces are a much different experience to write to finish and to play, they usually come out almost fully formed because they'll, they're, it's just a completely different way of, of thinking and hearing and playing music for me. The mm. fast stuff is more of, yeah, it's like this exercise where what I, I love about it is playing that way always 
it it opens my ear to hear things that aren't really there because the combination of the notes and all the string crossing and all like and all the repetition is making like you know different um overtones and like really really changing the way you're hearing something and then what i really like to do and it's like if you've heard any of my pieces you'll be like oh yeah that's what you do but i i like subtly put different energy into the phrases as I'm playing them. And it really, because of the way the instrument is so sensitive, it's so ridiculously sensitive, that instrument. So you can like completely change the tone and the color and the feeling and like the emotion of a thing while playing the exact same thing. And when you Mm -hmm. do that, like really fast with these, like also quite like tragic (laughs) emotional types of, melodic information like it's just it's kind of like this um (laughs) this like heady emotional vortex that you can kind of get lose yourself in does it feel like cathartic in a way or an exorcism of sorts i mean i keep feeling like there's a parallel to something on the top layers of our mind and like lots of thoughts and ideas and stuff and how that's coming out to form like this meta vibe through its repetition and through its little gyrations and I don't yeah. know if that's too overthinking it, but I do see from at least from the outside, there's that consistency in your your exploration of this. And yeah, it does create a kind of trance, mm-hmm. and it, but it also um, it's sort of like how the fast becomes the whole. I think of crickets because I I'm really into like field recordings, and you can have ten thousand crickets, but it's kind of making like this wave of white noise of yeah. one cricket. Yeah, but it's shifting, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, I think that's my ultimate goal, to be a wave of, like, white noise crickets. (laughs) That's a good goal. (laughs) That's awesome. I I hear a lot of, like, you know, the feedback that I get. People always say, the like, the most intensely personal or, like, people totally blow me away with their comments after a show if they come up, you know, and chat after. And it's always, like, this, uh, this, like, doorway in their mind is they've just like walked through some totally different area of their mind. And they're like, or I, I saw an entire movie and it was about my grandmother. Like, <laughs> it's a really, journey. Yeah, yeah. Like super journeying. And I'm like, oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done that kind of work journey work with where music's involved in a more traditional way? Shamanic work? Actually, not really. No, I, I did a little shamanic session once with a friend but it was like on the phone <laughs> <laughs> i went did a session <laughs> with a friend it was also on the phone but what he was doing was energy work so he wasn't saying anything but he recorded the sessions and sent me the recording so i could do the work afterwards but there was nothing on the recording oh wow and i was like this is next level like new so age it's just like <laughs> i i pressed play there's nothing there i was like bro am i missing something he's like no man you just need to meditate and continue to do the sessions and i'm like but you're not, no one's doing anything. I get it when I guess you're there and you're doing something and it's across yeah. time and space, but this is just a recording of you doing that. Audio. Yeah. Right. So like whether you can tap into that, I guess is, well, it's something you have to, to find out. You have to be ready for it, I guess. I don't know if I wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah. That's what they say about people who are looking for Sasquatch. If you haven't seen Scott's Sasquatch, they say, well, you're not ready. You know, you're not ready to see him. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, yes. And so can you also tell me, this is just a nerdy question. I often ask a lot of musicians on the show, just a little bit about gear. Uh, what have you found you like to use for recording your strings as far as mics, pedals, reverbs, stuff that works for you? So I've always left the record, like, like my pedals are more of a live thing. And and I also write with them because they give me that little slap back I need to... (laughs) to feel yeah. good about myself. Um, and a lot of the longer pieces, I use a, a long, a long reverb. And so like the live setup, I'm fairly certain that, you know, the, the big sky pedal is my, my best ally for reverb because I use the expression pedal so much with that. And, and I, I flirt around with different delays. Like I was a Mooger Fuger delay person for a long time, but then they kept breaking and, um, 
where have I landed? Oh, I've just, I've been using just like the boss giga delay, but the Al Capistan is really great. And, you know, I love delay pedals. I have so many different like delay pedals that are so particular. Yeah. But that's kind of, and I, I've, I use an octave pedal, like, especially for more pizzicato based stuff. I think an octave drop can be really special. Um, just cause it really like gives you this I don't know. I find it like, I don't love the sound of a bowed violin through an octave pedal kind of, it strikes me a little on the corny side, but I really like pitched. Um, yeah. I saw Owen Pallet's show with that. It's like yeah, fantastic. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I use, I use a good octave pedal. It's a, the walrus brand. It's like this really weird pedal company, I think. Uh, and I, it's not a weird pedal company. It's just not like one of the major pedals. <laughs> Sorry, Walrus, you're amazing. <laughs> Love your pedal. And then, uh, yeah, the miking the violin, like I, because I've never recorded my own stuff, I just, I, I go with whatever the engineer is, is using. And it's, it's always like, you know, some sort of great condenser mic, like the DPA stereo pair or, um, Didn't Nils from work with you on, on Hero Brother? Yeah, were yeah. you in Berlin? Mm-hmm. He's awesome. Really, That's he great that awesome. you guys work together. Yeah, that was a great experience. I actually did just buy uh, my first my first microphone to to use in that capacity because I want to start getting a little bit more serious because you know now we all have to be studio producers and engineers. Yeah, well, well it shouldn't be too complicated for you. Yeah. No, no. So I got the Sennheiser 8050, which I think sounds really, really great. Yeah, you just need something I think that sounds really natural mm-hmm. and a really clean signal because after that, people yeah. are going to mix it and manipulate exactly. it. So, yeah. 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 So I have that and I'm kind of interested in picking up a couple more mics here and there when, when I can and just, yeah, seeing if I can get a nice sound to work with. And what kind of music has been swirling around your life? that's been building your influences. Have you been a fan of Alice Coltrane? I have. Uh, well, I can't say fan. I've been a listener. I mean, I, I love her stuff, but I'm not yeah. like, uh, I'm not a, I don't earn the, the fan stripes because I've only listened to her, you know, a little, a little here and there, but yeah, her, she's amazing. Um, I listen to a lot of like, I st- still like to this day, like ever since I was 14, I listen to a lot of Aphex Twin. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like a, a lot of like other, I mean, I listen to a lot of Burial. Like I listen to uh-huh. to 90s hip hop. I listen to, um, you know, I listen Is there to- any uh, electronic music that's contemporary that you're really into? Because I heard you say that's an influence for you. I'm not like a huge electronic yeah. head, but I do like electronic music. And yeah. there's some of it that I'm like, I've been really inspired by lately. Yeah. You know, as far as contemporary people go, like I r- really love Rival Consoles. And uh, yeah. I mean, Burial's contemporary, but that's more, that's not, yeah. Rival Consoles is, is he makes beautiful, beautiful music. Um, Have you checked out Chiasmos? Yeah, Chiasmos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 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 oh man, all sorts of stuff, but I'm kind of blanking. I'm a big, I like, I listen to a lot of jazz and, mm-hmm. uh, just, but I'm not like a jazz player, but I got really into Keith Jarrett mm-hmm. and he's someone that, um, I really like his like long form improvisations, especially. Cool. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever heard some of the stories of like, he's got that really famous album called the Colne concert. It's from the seventies where, it's just him on a piano, and he's just kind of improvising. So it's not really jazz, it's not really classical. I haven't actually heard that, but I grew oh up with a lot of Keith Sarah. Jarrett. I grew up with more of like his the classics, the classic Keith Jarrett stuff. I grew up with a lot of jazz. Um, I love jazz. Actually, just kind of, I decided to like dive pretty hard into Bitches Brew this week because it's been a while <laughs> since I've listened to it. It's funny you say <laughs> that. I was listening to Miles Davis last night too, and it. When you yeah. put that on Spotify, first it's the classics, and yeah. then it gets into some deep cuts, and then it just gets yeah. weird. Yeah, you yeah. Know? <laughs> I just went straight for Bitches Brew. I, I do a lot of bike commuting these days around New York City, and I have these like particular routes that are about 40 minutes long, and I'm like, okay, it's like a, like an ominous sky. It's going to be a Bitches Brew ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But the, you should definitely check out the Cone concert. It's my favorite yeah, of all of his well. records. And uh, the story of creating it was that he's very particular about the pianos he played and that being the right instrument, which makes sense to me because, I mean, that's all he's doing. He's got like 3,000 people there. He's just sitting down trying to be inspired in the moment. So that's be it, the right sound and vibe for him. Yeah. And he wanted a Busendorfer piano, very specific. And they said, no problem, we have it. But he showed up and they didn't. It was actually it was partially broken. Certain keys weren't working right. The damper was messed up. And he's just he's like, I can't do it. It's impossible. And his piano tech tuner guy wasn't there. was sick. And the promoter was a almost a teenager. And it was like her first event, but they'd sold it out. So she was freaking out. She's like, everyone's showing up tonight. Is there anything we can do? And he's like, I'm sorry, no. And he left and they chased him out of the car and they're like, just, just work with our tech. Let's just try. And so they work on it and they fix this. And they put some toothpicks here and they do what they can. And he's just not feeling good about it. And he's, they convince him to try to do the concert. And they say, all right, but don't even bother recording it because he normally records them because this is going to be a disaster. I don't want to record a disaster. But then they decide, let's record it so we have proof of a disaster in case we need it, like something to do with the promoter. So he grabs, they didn't have any time, and they grab some quick dinner across the street at the Italian restaurant. And he eats too quickly. And now he has like indigestion. He's not feeling well. Oh, no. He's just down in the dumps. Guy, yeah, he travels with a, mass, a mattress, apparently. But anyway, so he walks on stage, and they start. he starts the concert. And with all of these kind of handicaps, and it becomes the most famous concert he's ever played. The, and the best-selling instrumental record of all time to this date. Wow, I can't wait yeah. to it. Yeah, and there's something there about the way limitations open a doorway of creativity yeah. or how it's sort of like your assumptions about what's going to happen, you know, it's kind of, he kind of threw something away in his mind, but then yeah. it opened him up. And also, he was avoiding parts of the piano, I think, because it had problems. But that limitation in itself, he started having to create these sort of like ostinatos and repetitions in certain zones because he wasn't he didn't have anywhere else to go. But that created this interesting meditative vibe right of, of how we would normally do a thing. Yes. Yeah. So I bring this up because I'm thinking about you know for you in this situation where we can't do all the things we could do before. And some of our habits and routines and ways of creation aren't available to us. Talk about limitations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, like, as you've been walking through this time and trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to do music and do your work today in an, with an unknown future? Like, I'm sure you've been facing some blocks or some feelings inside that are, like, kind of hard to overcome. But have you found, like, successes through that where you're like this is good actually. And here's why, or no, like to be honest, it's been kind of tough, you know, to feel motivated through it. Honestly, like I haven't felt blocked as a musician. Like I felt the time constraint sometimes just cause I, on the business side, there's been so much going right. on and so much to discuss all the time. But, you know, I work with an enormous, like, amount of limitation anyways. And that's kind of like, like writing soloistic violin composition is like the most limiting thing you can do. And I now write with like a bass synth pedal, like, whoa, two things happening. Right. It's like, but it's so limited that like, I'm great with limitation. I, I, you're feel, used to it. <laughs> I'm so used to it, but I'm like that as a person, like I'm highly adaptable to like really weird limiting situations. Like like I'll, I'll do yoga, like on a bus, you know, or under a truck. Like I've done yoga in the weirdest, most horrible situations and felt amazing after, you know? And like, so it's the same kind of thing. It's like, you just kind of like, as long as you can breathe, you know, yeah. you can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm used to sort of like rolling with whatever kind of uncomfortable set of circumstances there are um but yeah i you know what's really been nice besides just being having a more simplified life in new york city like more is the home life aspect like i'm getting to do things that i haven't done ever like i'm 40 and you know i've been on tour for my whole adult life basically and i 
haven't made much time for like planting flowers or, you know, so I've been doing things like that. Like I'm working up. I know everybody's been making sourdough. I'm still working up to it, but like, I <laughs> is that so? I didn't I, know that. Yeah, every, <laughs> That's the thing. Everybody I know is making sourdough. <laughs> I have to catch up to the Bread is back. Yeah. Okay. Back. But yeah, just stuff like that. Like, like normal stuff. I find it's really beautiful to, to engage with on a daily basis and not constantly in a cab on the way to an airport. Yeah. Just sort of bringing a little more balance into life to remember what life is all about, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We are in a time of change and I don't know. We just have to, I'm just asking for as much grace as I can to go through it because some days I feel pretty good about it. And some days I feel it's pretty confusing, but hey, it's helpful to talk to other musicians too and other people and just see how, you're walking through your walk. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it is. So I appreciate you giving us some time. Yeah. And, well, uh, nice sharing your world. You. Like, I, I didn't know who East Forest was. Like I knew your music, like not super. I, w- I wouldn't expect you to, to know it necessarily. I mean, it's kind I, of a niche. Kind of like, okay. Multiple times I've gone, Oh, what was that song? And it's been in like yoga classes or whatever. Or, like somebody was playing music. Oh, that's East Forest. And so I've, I've, I've asked that a few times and been told oh. it you. And, and I was always like, who is, who is that? It's funny because I, um, I mean, I, I date a yoga teacher and deep yogi, but I'm not, I don't know. I do yoga here and there, but I'm not like a hardcore yogi. Yeah. And I, my music got picked up in that community yeah. without me knowing anything. Like in 2014, when I was playing those Wanderlust festivals, I remember actually some of the classes I was playing for were in French and it didn't really matter to me because I didn't know the terminology anyway. <laughs> and everyone assumed, all the teachers assumed I knew everything. They're like, okay, I'm going to do the think and the think and I'm going to do the blank and the pot de bourre or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> it's like, I'll just vibe it out. It's and so funny at, from a musical perspective to, to watch what gets picked up and appears on everybody's class playlist. I know. I mean, it's viral. Like the Nils yeah. thing was crazy. When Nils Fromm started getting played in yoga classes, Nils Fromm started getting played in every yoga class. You too. Well, at least that's sure. fantastic music. I mean, I'm a huge, I have a big admirer of, of Nils' work. Um, yeah. But sometimes the yoga community, yoga community makes some strange choices on the music front. <laughs> but yes. yes, it has and it does. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was... I've kind of had a backdoor introduction into that world. And so I've kind of been learning over the years and becoming more of a yogi myself and in- introducing that sort of ethos into my life. Um, but it wasn't like, I wasn't making music for that, I guess. You know what I'm saying? Like, And then I just you like, ended up just, with the name Krishna, so. And I know, now it's a done deal, I guess. Yeah, but. <laughs> You're officially drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The blue Kool-Aid. Um, but I, I do have, um, I mean, a lot of musicians are steadfastly against having sort of an agenda with their music, but I, I really do. And that's just my personal ethos. I like, I really like making music that's deeply emotional and, and pushes you inside. And because that's what I, that's what I like to feel, you know? So when I'm making the music, yeah. that's where I like to try to do with myself. I try to yeah. like really, how, how far can I go inside and really touch something that feels sort of yeah ineffable and ephemeral i do the same thing i like to get really close to a raw nerve (laughs) yeah yeah something really real you know it's just like i'm trying to cut through the layers and just be like and i want to i feel like if you you hit a moment when you're playing like oh there it is you know oh there's that oh there's that and it's like a feeling in my stomach or something or in my heart where i'm like i feel like i finally like reach some kind of core layer or like a really painful massage where it's just like yeah (laughs) Uh, it's it hurts but don't stop yeah yeah Yeah. so but there's i think it's a unique challenge when you're essentially doing it by yourself and i do think that playing with other people or bands i used to be in a band but now it's a solo project where i i work with people whenever i can Mm -hmm. but it's a different form of of creating and i very much miss that where i'm not responsible for everything in a sense yeah i mean sometimes that's great it's yeah, super you can, fun. <laughs> it's so liberating. I would and, imagine something like Arcade Fire or Bell Orchestra is like 
an it's amazing so, sense so of different. collaboration. Like I, don't, I don't feel nauseous before shows, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. When I, I when don't, I don't like have to have all eyes on me. Every yeah. single note. Yeah. Yeah, there's something else to lean on. Yeah. Um, um, but you've that's one of the things I've noticed with people who play strings is they have the ability to collaborate in ways that's usually really vast and wide and they, they get to meet lots of great people and do lots of amazing projects because it can fit into so many things. Mm-hmm. It's great. Yeah. I, I always, I always want for more collaborations with different kinds of projects and and people because, uh, you know, we all get in our like tracks and stuff and I've learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, I mean, I feel like my world is quite small right now between my, my solo stuff and my, my couple of bands. And I'm always wanting, like, I feel like I want, to to learn more to to work with more people and yeah. I, I there's no end to to what I feel I can learn from working with others yeah me too and that's one of the harder things right now particularly um, because I'm I, like I'm working on something and I'm used to hiring friends and stuff we get you know come over we're going to record and it's like yeah okay what do we do now you know and it gets mm-hmm. more complicated yeah yeah well, cool. Cool. Well, where can people drop into your world if they want to? I mean, I know you're on all the listening platforms, but what yeah. do you want to direct people to? Well, I mean, my new stuff is not out yet. And I'm just going to be figuring a plan out for that. And and Bellarcast's new stuff will be coming out hopefully sometime soon. And there'll be lots of new stuff coming out. And right now, right now, it's my... <laughs> my stuff is just what it was before. It was like my last album actually came out in 2016. Mm-hmm. I have been work like the new body of work that I'm going to put out under my solo project came from a dance collaboration that I did for the past couple of years with this amazing um, Canadian choreographer. She's a really like iconic um, soloist from decades and decades of incredible work. I mean, she danced with a lot of people in the States too, but her name's Peggy Baker and she's, you know, she's in her sixties and she's just a total force of nature and an incredible, incredible artist and very inspiring. And so I collaborated with her and wrote an entire like full length hour long, you know, whatever with her company like seven dancers and jeremy gara the drummer from arcade fire who played like we play together quite a bit he worked on it with me and so he's also like on the record and and uh but that like that was kind of the wormhole i went i went down immediately after arcade fire finished like the everything now tour almost two years ago now i've been really like on this dance tour which has been so so cool but but that those were like shows at dance festivals around the world and and like i said like the that material or what it turned into in record form which is a bit different has yet to come out but i'm really excited to put it out and yeah like just my you know i whenever i do something i i usually post to instagram like at at sarah k newfeld and my website is like quasi up to date (laughs) <laughs> but yeah I look, I look forward to to putting out that music and 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 hopefully people can listen to that and cool we can all keep keep making our stuff yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah well thank you again for taking the time and yeah. it's awesome to be able to to meet you yeah great talking to you man thank you sarah for giving us your time i really really enjoyed uh, getting to know you a little better and i know all of you did as well Check out her music. Check out all the projects she is a part of. Musicians these days always need people supporting them. We were the first to be out of work. We'll probably be the the last to come back as far as the touring landscape is concerned. Um, But Sarah's a total sweetheart and an amazing musician. So thank you, Sarah, for coming on board. This song you're hearing in the background is the instrumental version of Viana Vayu on an older album of mine called Orbits and you can listen to that wherever you listen to music thanks again for giving the podcast a review thanks for sharing it Uh, thanks for sending your notes and words we had an email come in from Carrie 
She's just letting me know about a few things, including a recent album from San Quentin Mixtape, Volume 1. She says it's pretty inspiring what these incarcerated men have created. I believe the album was released on the brink of COVID-19, spreading rapidly through the prison. The album is special, the backstory is complicated, and the lyrics speak to the hearts. Cool. I will check that out. She's letting you know too, and uh, thanks for sending a note, and thanks for those messages online. Listen, it's hot out there, the summer is continuing, and things are getting pretty darn wacky out there, so um, keep your head on straight. Things are being destroyed, but things are being born, and a lot of them are yet to be seen. Maybe they're felt in the more tender layers of your heart, but they're there. So keep walking your walk. Don't take any shit, but if you do, do it with grace.